Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Harmeet. Um, uh, I'm hosting Data Engineering Melbourne Meetup with my um, friends and co host Ryan and Tim. Uh, so uh, today uh, we are going to, we have a very interesting topic, which is like how to effectively deliver uh, 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 ML products. And it mostly talks about the teams. And then after that, we'll have a small um, a sh short time for community marketplace. It's basically about, you know, if there's anything that you want to, if you have jobs, uh, you're looking for a job, feel free to pitch in yourself. Or if you're a recruiter and you're looking for someone, pitch, feel free to pitch your job or if there's, there's a conference or maybe an open source, you're looking for someone to contribute, feel free to pitch in. So without further ado, uh, I will hand it over to David Tan. Um, and maybe David, I can stop sharing and you can share your screen. Yeah, sounds good. And uh, since we have a, quite an intimate setting, I just wanted to get a kind of quick temperature check. Um, who here plays a data engineer role in your work? If you're off video, you can give a thumbs up or yeah, about half. Uh, who has worked on a ML or ML-ish project before? Yeah, and for that ML-ish project, um, who's had to kind of roll your own, like, you know, the training data, the training model, the deployment, all of that, um, if you can give me a hands up. Okay, so about uh, majority of us, so I think a lot of the things we cover here, you will uh, probably relate to. And I'll just share my screen. And again, it's a kind of intimate setting, so feel free to you know, pause anytime, ask questions, so that's okay. Okay, let me just get my windows all sorted. Cool, so this is um, the ML Ops Handbook that uh, I and a couple of colleagues started putting together based on our reflections on projects where we've you know, done and used ML. And yeah, you know, it's a guide for improving the effectiveness of ML teams. Yeah, I'm an ML engineer with ThoughtWorks, and I've been about on about I've been fortunate enough to be on about seven data slash ML projects, uh, and some other software engineering gigs as well. So personally, I learned heaps from these experiences. What's worked well, what uh, didn't work so well for us, and I hope to share them with you today. And um, the plan is that we talk about the costs of missing out on ML ops and continuous delivery for ML. And here I may be preaching to the choir. You may already be across these things. Um, but if you're not, then we can start to see why these things are important. And then we'll go through the handbook, what it is, what um, problems to solve, and how you can use it for um, a, a exercise like this in your team. And then we start to piece together the puzzle, this whole thing, what we call ML Ops culture. There's many definitions out there. And here I attempt. Um, a definition again, and what are the principles and then supporting practices to help us get there, and yeah, some takeaways. And a caveat here is that currently the self-assessment checklist or the MLS hand, MLOps handbook is internal to ThoughtWorks at the moment, and intern, I'm still assessing whether there's value to kind of invest effort to make it available to the community. So later on, towards the end of the talk, I'll do a poll. Uh, actually, I, I may trouble Hamid in the background to create that poll and probably 30 minutes into the talk, we'll kind of get some sense check from you. It'd be great to get feedback on that. And I might breeze through here a little bit because I still saw a lot of hands, you know, you probably have experience on this. So I think you already know why, uh, what, what, the, what is the cost of not um, following some of these, um, you know, engineering based practices. Typically, when I give this talk, I start with that story about you know, the, the data science story. Like, it's quite common to see data science being siloed in a data science team. You have to maybe bribe a data engineer or you know, raise a request for a one-time data dump of things. So that team shape, number one, is you know, uh, not optimal for fast feedback loop and things like that. And usually, you know, we work in Spike more. You've got your Jupyter notebooks, and you may validate or prove a concept and business might you know, be sold, but you see, okay, this is great. And now then productionizing 
is where like 90% of the pain comes in, right? We've got, you know, this throwing coat over the wall. And personally, I've seen like this main dot py, the main v1, main v2, v3, to v6, and each of them is like you know 600 lines of code. So without any test, any kind of change is brittle, error prone. And you know, th this whole energy and buzz about the idea usually just kind of lose a lot of steam over there. Um, and another thing is about like data. So the training serving asymmetry, you may have that one time data dump for training, but then when it comes to real time inference or you know, inference at scale, getting that data available is you know, a whole new challenge. So teams sometimes think about that last, but perhaps you should find that concern. And you know, it could be productionized, it might run, and then things are working and you know, people might, uh, many management or business comes and say, hey, uh, I know this model is 91% accurate on the holdout set, but uh, you know, how was last month's performance? How many wrong predictions did it make? Usually, you know, if, if this is making you feel uncomfortable, then there's the right feeling and you're not alone. These are hard questions that we can't answer unless we kind of instrument that and make it as part of the, make explainability in as part of the um, architecture, explainability and observability. So taking a step back, many organizations have played this game. So in 2019, 87% um, of players lost this game, didn't make it to production. Uh, this is a bit of an old statistic from 2019. Uh, Algorithme puts out an annual survey, which is very nice. And in the 2020 survey, they saw that 58% of companies that have ML in production take more than a month to deploy a new model. And I thought that um, I updated the figures for this talk. And in the re most recent survey, the number actually went up. So 64% of uh, companies take more than a month to deploy a new model. So, and this is not just costly in terms of release delays or unrealized business value. On the ground, I can see and feel like employee frustration, data scientists, you know, feeling burnout and there's turnover. And, you know, if data science is the 21st century's sexiest job, then how come there's so much toil, so much dissatisfaction, burnout and turnover? So then the next question is, how can we avoid these pitfalls? And, you know, not just survive this journey, but thrive. And that, that is where um, ML Ops Handbook, we try to kind of bring together learnings from the data science world and also the engineering world. And we are fortunate enough to partner with various organizations on their journey for on ML to productionize, productize them. So this is a distillation of the kind of pitfalls and obstacles we see. Invariably, these toil, sources of toil come up and again and again. And we've seen that there's a set of capabilities and practices that can anticipate these pitfalls and you know, circumvent them and improve the, the flow and you know, the feeling of flow within the team and the flow of value to users. So we broadly structured it to, from like, you know, the principle, the practices and the cultural norms that um, help teams succeed in ML. Um, so we don't have to be excellent at every practice and everything. You, you kind of start by assessing where you are at and where you want to be. So perhaps like maybe one category just doesn't apply to you, then you can just skip it all together. But there are some things that, you know, for example, testing, automated testing that applies to, you know, most of everyone. So that's the thing. Um, and then from there, we've got um, this gap analysis, which, which gives us two things. One of it is that it can be a leading indicator. For example, if an organization is diving right, one of the practices here we talk about is uh, user testing or you know, you know, uh, basically validating ideas before you know, doing it. If we don't, if we are building something, we're diving right into the engineering without user testing. We've seen this movie, we know how it ends. Typically, you know, we might build the thing right and after 12 months found that you know, it's not the right thing, not what users needed or wanted. And then secondly, this list becomes the starting point for a value-based prioritization within the team. Say, okay, maybe let's do better in you know, test coverage or in something, user testing, talking to people. Um, so we will cover specifically what these practices are. So with that prefaced, uh, let's, uh, I'll attempt to break down 
to you know what this possibly fuzzy thing called ML ops and it's important that we start with culture because it's not just about tools and practices. I think sometimes when we hear ML ops, we hear like, okay, uh, you know, this ML platform or use Kubeflow or use, uh, you know, this certain thing. At, at the end of the day, it's the tools and practices are important, but then, you know, the right mindset is, is kind of the glue that holds everything together. So borrowing from the DevOps world, um, I just quickly read the definition and then tell the story. So ML Ops foster a culture where people, regardless of title, background, whether you're a data scientist, your ops, your engineer, your UX, we work together to imagine, develop, deploy, operate, and improve ML systems continuously. So you might recall this meme before from the DevOps world, like devs would write code and then throw it over the wall, then ops people will spend countless nights, you know, deploying this undeployable thing. And with DevOps, a few years ago, this wall broke down, right? Devs can write infra code, ops can write tests, and we pair and we are a cross-functional team, you know, we just maximize everyone's awesomeness. But here today, I think it's still common to see like a data science team or ML team doing a spike or some proof of concept and then throwing it over the wall, um, which, you know, that operating model could work uh, in some certain, you know, constraints or environment as a sustainable delivery thing. Um, this often, you know, is where things break down. And so that's the kind of context and the, the cultural, um, you know, setting. And now let's, let's break down, uh, I'll break down four principles. And for each principle, we have the supporting practices and the checklist that kind of helps activate or support this principle. And the first one is about feedback loops. And so the question here is, are our feedback loops as short as they can be? So there are three examples here. One is from user testing. So instead of releasing our models, you know, or ML product six to 12 months after, you know, engineering and, you know, uh, deployment and delivery, and then finally showing to the users, can we put the horse before the cart and you know, talk to users? Like maybe there are these three user experiences you know, and validating with users first through product, prototype testing, um, talking to people, and we find that, okay, maybe this green thing, maybe, maybe that's not an ML solution and maybe that's what people prefer. And then we scale that. Um, so, I think I've been, I've seen or been on teams where like you just, engineering is exciting, right? You put a room full of engineers, you want to just build things. But then after months of effort, then, you know, we put it out there and it's, um, you know, maybe users like, okay, you know, I don't like this non-deterministic nature of ML, maybe, maybe that should have been another thing. So that's one angle. Another way to, sh about feedback loops, about automated testing. So it's, um, I, I think I'm preaching to the choir here. So instead of manual testing, like restarting and rerunning the whole notebook and then checking if something is wrong, that is very tedious um, and error prone. So can we apply engineering practices to write automated tests? You know, within seconds and minutes, you are getting feedback on the code change. And that kind of fast feedback enables the developer on the ground, the data scientists on the ground to change and iterate on the code with a you know safety net and positive feeling that you know you are, you haven't broken something else there and the last one is about feedback loops to ourselves as a team so this is more the human side of things um, instead of waiting for you know an exit interview and you know people leaving to find oh actually you know I left because of this reason like could we have front loaded that with you know safe team retros having you know, a safe space, uh, modeling that kind of vulnerability to say like, it's okay, we made this mistake, maybe we wasted this sprint on nothing and can we have start having conversation or you know, talk to people? Yeah, get that feedback there and then as a team rather than you know, waiting till the exit interview. So um, this human theme comes up again and again. Um, 
I've done some lit research or lit review, literature review and research on ML ops guidance or guidebooks out there. A lot of it focuses on engineering, but later on we'll see that the human element is just as important, if not critical for uh, the success. So um, really quickly, this is the kind of a diagram that you will see again and again. Um, at the, uh, let me just orientate ourselves. So on the outside, all we want, we all want the same thing, right? We want happy customers, we want happy team members. Um, we want to deliver value. And to get there, our mode of delivering value in the software world is delivering software. So delivering flow, how features get into production and the quality of those things that get into production. Um, and what facilitates that, um, the principles at the core and then five categories of practices. So, so the first thing we talk about is fast feedback and I've highlighted the things that um, add, contribute to that fast feedback. So I may, I may just pick one from each and talk through them. So um, I'll start with engineering. So we've already talked about automated testing. So in healthy projects, you know, you've got high test coverage, your data transformations, everything, you know, runs on CI um, within seconds or minutes. You can reproduce them identically locally as you're developing code before you push maybe a git hook runs all your tests make sure that you know you're not pushing broken code if it's going to fail in production first tell me on ci if it's going to fail on ci tell me first on my git you know my local development so reducing the feedback from maybe days or weeks to literally minutes as you're developing um in terms of um data so um, I've had the luxury of working on a client where data discovery was done really well. Like you can go to a data discovery tool and see, you know, you've got this data set, these are the attributes and that. So um, instead of having to, you know, hear about things through the grapevine or through, you know, private messages here and there, like, you know, we kind of have established a culture and a habit that um, when you have a data product or a data set to kind of have a discipline of documenting that. Um, from ML engineering perspective, um, I think one really interesting one is um, maybe bias, bias test, I think we call out here because we'll talk about another one later. So bias test, um, just not just the top level ML metric, but you know, if we care, if, if maybe the model has a risk of being biased by some dimension of the data, a popular one is you know, race or gender, then can we write a test? So in our pip pipeline to segment the data set by that dimension, let's say race or gender, and uh, run it as part of the pipeline. So if ever we're gonna train and deploy a model that is maybe biased towards women or men, um, then you know that CI pipeline will fail and this thing could not go into production. So rather than finding out again from user complaints to bring it back to our own instrumented tests, um, I think we'll talk about the uh, monitoring in the, the next section as well. And uh, Ryan, I uh, see you raised your hand. Yeah, um, so just um, one of the things that's sort of in my mind and you'll talk there about bias in terms of um, bias in the you know, uh, ethical sense kind of made me also think about bias where often, at least in my experience, uh, the data sets that I'm working with um, in the case of some sort of classification, there's always like a severe imbalance. Like there's more, you know, uh, you know, negative cases than positive cases, as it were. So, um, in de dealing with that class imbalance, would 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 that be a, a suitable place to kind of slot in some tests, just to kind of say we know we're working with an imbalanced data set, so let's just make sure that you know we're getting relevant result results still. Mm, yeah, I think that makes sense. So, I think the Data scientists and ML people usually have an in implicit way of, you know, knowing if, of knowing these things. I, I don't know how to articulate that, but usually we are running a notebook and then we'll check like, okay, maybe for this class accuracy is, you know, just not right, you know. So it's about kind of talking to data scientists and trying to instrument that and automate that. Typically, I think we usually have an implicit uh, measure or, of goodness. If not at the start of the project, maybe 
like a user complaints, and then okay, we look into that, and then you know usually right. some implicit measures that come out of that. So that that comes back to the having that fast feedback loop, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Cool. Uh, and then feedback loops about um, ways of working. So I think one story maybe I can tell from a past project is about vertical. Did I write it here? Um, I think uh, vertically slicing. The, I say work here, but I think I meant to say vertically sliced teams. So an ND pattern was like we had a data science team that made a change, and then they have to hit, ping another team like, hey, API team, can you please deploy that? API teams go like, okay, please wait two days. I'm working on a story now. And you know, when two days come and then context is all gone, and this whole back and forth handovers is just a big source of waste. So when we finally restructure the team to be cross-functional, we've got data scientists, ML engineers, uh, API developers, testers, like we are an independent, autonomous, empowered team that can bring a change into production. So if we see this kind of back and forth, then it's a problem. So in the, in the questionnaire that I'll show at the end, this is one of the questions we asked. And if we have this handover between team, then it's a suggestion that maybe something's not right. Uh, so on to the next principle and feel free to uh, raise your hand and ask any questions along the way. I'll uh, just quickly open chat. <laughs> Untitled, yes. Cool. So um, build quality. in. So in machine learning, we typically want to know a few things about our model. Uh, I'll cover three things. Number one is, is this model that I just trained better than the one, another model, for example, the one in production? That's the evaluation problem. <coughs> and how is model X doing? How is the production model doing? Um, you know, that's the monitoring problem. And perhaps number three question mark here is why did model X predict this instead of that um, explainability? So historically, we typically looked into our models by manual prodding or ad hoc analysis. So um, I had again the luxury of being on a team where we learned that it didn't have to be this way. So maybe I can tell a story here. So we used to get customer questions about, hey, why did I get this uh, prediction? And then data scientists have to drop everything they do and spend maybe one to two days, dig through various this and that and try to see, okay, the model predicted this because of that. That's um, frustrating. Uh, sometimes data scientists left because um, just it was not what they wanted to do uh, from a data science perspective. So in the end, what we ended up doing was to architect our API, expose an endpoint where your weights for every prediction, every request, um, the factors that went into that prediction um, would be there. So we can simply reproduce the customer's query and see, okay, um, it got this value because of you know, this and that. And it was a self-service dashboard, so it didn't need a data scientist to um, explain what was going on. Um, anyone could do it. Um, anyone who was on support that week could do it. So that, that was a really nice learning for me. So I think then the challenge here is for the engineers to think, okay, how can we instrument and automate these things? So the first question about evaluation, um, putting your model metrics as part of your path to production and your CI pipeline or the data pipeline. Uh, explainability I already mentioned and monitoring, uh, you know, ensuring that we have you know, monitoring in place. Um, so I'll dive in a little bit deeper about this. Um, you may be, I think, I, again, I may be preaching to the choir, but typically I, when I give this talk, I talk about, I assume like um, maybe we don't know about how things are done in software world. So I map, show it how it's done and then I map it to the ML world. So in software world, um, just some quick legends, uh, orange is the action, light green or teal is your quality gates and green is, or dark blue is like you know, deployment or training. So this is a like probably healthy CI pipeline. On a code change, we run our unit tests on CI. If it should fail, we get that feedback within minutes, we iterate. Then, you know, if your 
external world is depending on you you have contract tests around that your integration tests if it's all good then yeah fine deploy to staging or pre-prod and one thing i saw which was really awesome is that right after deploying the pre-prod we can run our post-deployment tests and by this time there's actually nothing stopping us from deploying to prod um you know barring your you know organizational i don't know reasons um if my change has made it to that point and i have feature toggles and i have really high coverage and i'm confident that this change is ready for production then what we did was you know we just go to prod um and there's proactive monitoring and notification if there should be any alerts that's again feedback maybe i didn't expect this scenario or this kind of data and that's quick feedback and we can iterate from there um the contrast of that is like maybe we don't do this deployment prod deployment step and we kind of chunk up 100 changes or 200 changes and when we do go out and alerts start coming in and then okay like which change caused that outage so um so this is would be a healthy thing and in terms of production deployment every change into production is you know 10 to between 10 to 20 minutes so that's again that kind of fast feedback as compared to waiting for a release train or a monthly release that feedback would be a month right so mapping that into the ml world the difference is that the another thing that can trigger a model change is also the data right not just the behavior of the code so again i think this is probably what i would say could be a help it would be a healthy pipeline make the code change um you run your tests again feedback um you run so what we had was a model training test our model could take between one model takes half an hour another model takes three hours so what we had was a kind of two minute ex, uh training that just exercised all the code paths with a dummy data end to end and if that should blow up because of a certain line i don't find out like half hour later or three hours later i found out within two minutes and then we have a kind of mini artifact that we wrap up into a image that we deploy so before we do deploy that we we know that the world depends on our api so we run those contract tests ensure that we are still fulfilling that promise to the world and we say all good all right let's kick off that three hour training and then we when that training is done we trigger an event that checks the model quality like if it drops below x percent accuracy then we just fail the build um, we can also compare models at this point and then deploy to pre-prod to prod things like that um, and again same thing here with monitoring and another thing here is about um, closing the data collection loop so your, our users are out there using the thing and that's really valuable signal so collecting the ground truth and having scalable data labeling mechanisms um, so the flavor of this implementation will vary for different things so if it's image then um, you know there are labeling studios uh, on you know the class provider that you're on or i think there are implementations out there that you can stand up but the, i think the general idea here is that how can we think about closing that data collection loop so that we improve the model from um like a data what's what's the word for it um more like a data-centric approach to improving ml not just you know tweaking hyperparameters which at some point we will hit a limit so taking that data-centric approach so um i'll wrap up and then pause for some questions so um building quality in uh, we've talked about a few things um the tests shifting left on security so having that conversation uh, in a big organization usually there's that security you know checklist or things like that security champions having that conversation earlier rather than later um Data test grid. So Hamid uh, has written a really great article, which we can share at the end about code plane tests and data plane tests. So putting that as part of your pipeline rather than doing manual testing of um, data quality. Yeah, grading quality in. I think we've talked about a few examples about model um, observability just now. And monitoring not just the service level metrics or model level metrics, but also um, 
uh, yeah, sorry, sorry. Um, uh, not just service, but also the model, the model quality. Any thoughts or questions before I go on to the next two principles? Cool. So a midpoint break, we've talked about feedback loops and quality. And the next two points, we're kind of shifting gears away from engineering a little bit. And I want to take a moment to call out the importance of language. Um, usually when we say something is an ML problem, what comes to your mind? Maybe the first thing you think is, okay, data science, algorithms, uh, supervised learning, unsupervised learning, how much data do I have? Engineering, ML ops. Um, but then what if we say it's a product problem? Then other words come to mind, like uh, user experience, um, user testing, product delivery. So maybe maybe it's just me. I think when I see ML problems, straight away we kind of start to form around a team around that problem that is shaped of ML-ish people, like data science, ML ops, ML engineers. And we do that to our own detriment, I think, because at the end of the day, it's, not, never, it's never really just an ML problem. Um, it's also like, you know, delivering a product. So that's the, what the next two topics will talk about. So in the next principle about lean delivery, we focus on the set of practices that support effective delivery. So what I've seen is that we can excel in all these other areas of engineering, but um, without the right ways of working, without the right team shapes, then, you know, ML projects can easily fail. So with that, let's dive in. Um, so yeah, lean delivery, um, it's about building the right thing. So I think the first two principles is a lot about agile and, you know, um, building the thing right. And lean is about, you know, building the right thing. And yeah, we're, I won't talk about design thinking here, but in combination, lean sits in a holistic space like this. And actually, I learn lean, you know, through, through the project. And I found this definition very helpful for me to say what this lean thing is. So first of all, is to identify the value from the user's point of view. Use value is defined as what the customer is willing to pay for. Um, so we will find this through quantitative or qualitative research. And the next thing we want to do is to map that value stream. So once that value is defined, like, okay, people want to pay for, I don't know, bubble tea, right? So um, then how do we map that value stream from um, in, in, turn it into a tangible goal for, to create that value, value chain or value stream, map all the steps from raw stuff to that cup of bubble tea or the shop. Um, by making this visible, teams, we can start to analyze and improve our delivery processes by spotting bottlenecks, uh, loopbacks, pain points, uh, handovers, and delays. So that, that's probably a whole talk can be uh, crafted out of this. And there's probably a lot of resources on the internet to see how this is done. And the next thing uh, is about creating flow, this process of spotting and smoothing out these bottlenecks and pain points in getting bubble tea into a user's hands. Um, and by visualizing and optimizing, and most, most importantly, I think measuring, teams can start to quantify where the bottlenecks are and have conversation about, okay, maybe can we improve this handover process or maybe what, what is this bottleneck here? And the fourth thing is about establishing pool. So I think the intent here is that no work starts before um, the user kind of, has, that there's that pull from um, the demand, like there's a value for it. So we pull that work in. Um, I may be mangling this, but I think that's the rough idea. And finally, the continuous improvement, as we mentioned, um, um, kind of quant quantifying the, the, like the, the bottlenecks or the flow and see where what areas can we improve on. So lean delivery has revolutionized um, you know, the manufacturing industry and software industry. And I, I believe ML is no exception. So in the next few slides, we'll try to translate this into tangible things in the, in the ML project world. Um, so one way with a lean delivery mindset, then 
Um, sorry, I'm losing my train of thought a little bit, but I think this slide is in basically saying like um, when we deliver values for the thin slicing from the user need from the feature, then working backwards to just build like enough rather than horizontal slicing, like go away and build a data platform for two years and then say, okay, now we've got data for you, data scientists, so do that thing. So that's a definitely an anti-pattern to watch out for. And even going one level lower, this um, is about execution. So on the ground, this slide will talk through a few maybe anti-patterns and what could be better ways of doing it. So given like, say we have, you know, done all the inception and all of those things and say we've got that vertical slice MVP, it still takes another set of discipline and practices to, I think, excel in the delivery. I think an anti-pattern I've seen is like, you know, you've just got a wall of cards and there's no pool-based thing. People, maybe I pick up a card just because I have time and this problem looks interesting to me. Um, and invariably, you know, if we kind of don't watch ourselves or catch ourselves, then we can kind of slip away from that user value perspective. Um, and another thing I'm trying to visualize here is about ways of working, like turn, sort of soloing and not really pairing or sharing that context. And perhaps an alternative that I, I've seen in my project is, you know, drawing that line and establishing user value. Like this thing may be fun and fancy, but, you know, for prioritizing value above, above that. Uh, then we are pairing on those valuable stories. We are tracking the metrics, your estimates, your velocity. And this is something I learned from the BAs and just seeing like the magic of quantifying the work we're doing and how and what throughput a team uh, is going through then. So these are not hard numbers, right? It's not saying five people can finish, you know, five story cuts in two days. It's more like, okay, given this team and what we know, um, one moment. Sorry, it's dinner time. <laughs> so quantifying and measuring that, and then, yeah, it's just really nice to be able to see, quantify that flow. So Lin, um, yep, so Lin delivery. Yeah, there's a couple of practices that met today. Oh. Okay. He's watching Pokoyo. <laughs> uh, cool. So the last one. Yeah. So I think maybe I've talked about a lot of things, and this is an attempt to say, like, you know, just if we distill it down to one thing, to look back on our team, like, okay, how have we delivered value to the users this iteration? And that can be an uncomfortable question sometimes, but I think it starts conversations about, um, you know, things. And the final principle is about prioritizing safety. So in our line of work, we may not lose a finger to an, or an arm to heavy machinery, right? But there are still plenty of ways to compromise our own safety and others. So in terms of harm to self, like our, our engineers or people, um, I'm sure you've heard of stories that a code change accidentally brought down production systems and cost like millions of dollars. Um, so um, in, in contrast, you know, from an internal engineering safety perspective, um, your CI pipelines would catch that um, before, you know, there's even that chance of this to go out into production. And in terms of harm to others, imagine that in this diagram, um, this defect is there that maybe disproportionately disadvantages a subset of users. You know, if it's just uh, your CI pipelines, if it's not kind of robust enough, then it comes down to this one person to say, all right, looks good to me. Let's go by faith and deploy this to production. And then people are harmed. So if we can instead instrument those uh, quality measures, then we can prevent that kind of uh, adverse outcome. And this is not just a hypothetical example. So there are plenty of ways that ML can do bad things about predictive policing, reinforcing racial biases. Uh, one moment, sorry.
in the physical meetups. I mean, I want a babysitter. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I think we've seen these stories before. Predictive policing, enforcing racial biases in data. Data is biased, mo model is biased. Simple as that. Um, recruiting tools shows bias against women. Uh, algorithms kind of healthcare. This teacher was creative and motivating, but got fired. So um, I want to add a dimension to this about the dark side of bureaucracies. So you may have heard of the Stanford County prison ex experiment where in the 70s, where subjects were asked to administer some electric shocks to a, you know, a, a kind of someone in the research team, I guess, um, sometimes even to a very dangerous level. So the study's general idea is that this bureaucratic layer like, because I told this person to administer shocks and, you know, that test subject is just following rules or following instructions, like, you know, those shocks got to a pretty high level. So if I kind of reflect on my own experience, like I am a few levels removed from the end user in the bureaucracy. There's the product team, there's the compliance team, and, you know, I'm, I'm just an engineer, right? So it's really easy for us to be removed from them. And so there is like uh, no kind of magic bullet. It's more like, uh, maybe I think I tell it the story through a uh, story. So, you know, maybe like N percent rate is, we think, okay, maybe, maybe like 85% accuracy is okay. But then when, uh, when we are the 15% out there on the pointy end, um, you know, then you start to think, okay, maybe 85% is not that good. At the end of the day, machine learning is still determinist, sorry, non-deterministic, still probabilistic. But how can we kind of build uh, mechanisms around that? Like, you know, mechanisms for redress or maybe when the confidence is too low, then can we, you know, call in an agent or something like that? So there, there are other ways, but I think the starting point is like just being mindful and aware of, you know, this bureaucratic effect. Um, so I want to share a resource from ThoughtWorks that is um, pretty helpful in exploring this area. So in terms of like data ethics, um, you know, the data we're using or collecting, mm, what, you know, what angles can we look at it? Like, do we have user consent? Um, is that PI, things like that. And I haven't, you know, worked through majority of the examples, just I think I've tried this one, but uh, yeah. Um, you can check it out Let's see how it, it can be a resource for your uh, context. So coming back to safety uh, in the checklist of MLM book, um, internal safety is our CI, there, there's a few things, but CI CD is one of them, automated testing, um, psychological safety in terms of your retros, and in external safety, um, user testing, talking to users, uh, having channels for redress. Um, forget where I put that. But, um, you know, are your model quality tests, your bias tests. <coughs> so th there's a set of like, maybe like if you think of yourself, you're on the factory floor, you're producing parts, like there's, there's a set of safety practices that we just check off. And these are some of them. And so, um, so some takeaways. And I, in, the way I see it, I think uh, for a few years now, two worlds are colliding, um, software world, data world, um, but cohesion and collaboration is not a given. Um, I think it needs to be intentionally cultivated and cultured. And through this preparation, the, through preparing this talk, I found out that culture is actually a verb. So, or oh, actually it could be a, oh, sorry. You know, in dictionaries, there's like nouns, versions, of verb. So culture could also be a verb. Of the, it's the act of growing cells. So it's the act, the culture is the act of intentionally, you know, having the right shaped teams, right ways of working, right engineering practices um, to basically um, kind of help us on this journey to where we want to go. So on one hand, we've got a software world where you know we've got great research. Um, Accelerate is one such book. 
that survey thousands of companies that say you know high performance software companies have these and practices in common. So from a ways of working perspective, limiting work in progress, making work visible, feedback from production, and then from engineering perspective, having tests, having CI, CD. Um, so that we know in the software world. And to the extent that we can collaborate in the data space to have these uh, practices, I think it's where we can accelerate uh, delivery of ML as well. And on the other side, right? So I've paired with data scientists, and sometimes they tell me things, and we're like, "Whoa, what's going on?" But you know, there's so much to learn, like um, in terms of um, you know model explainability, instrumenting quality measures. So it's kind of coming together and having that alignment and um, cohesion. So. And I, I've seen also teams getting stuck just because these two worlds, maybe for whatever reason, are not cohesing or not becoming together and uh, aligning. So, um, so yeah, we, we just got to be intentional in, in, in cultivating that. So this is the detailed lab version of that checklist. So just now I mentioned a few things like particularly slice teams. So in the handbook, there's a set of questions that you can use to see are you on one side of the spectrum or the other side of the spectrum so for example let's take uh, vertically sliced teams maybe we can say teams are horizontally sliced each slice being a single function team like we've got a data engineering team we've got a data science team we've got an api team uh, maybe there is a top slice ml poc without that investment in you know production the, the whole vertical team slice and maybe there's frequent backlog coupling. Like I make a change and I need to have a change in another team's backlog before this feature can go to production together. Uh, in contrast, you know, um, a high performing team would have cross-functional teams like we mentioned just now. There's no, no or limited need to have this handoff between teams and teams can you know, move quickly. Um, taking that vertical slice from top to bottom from end users at the top to data at the bottom something like that. And at this point, I might trouble uh, Hamid to share a poll of a question. Or maybe um, I can just ask the question verbally, should I? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was not able to somehow, you know, but I think yeah. we cannot edit the meeting while awesome. doing yeah. this. So I was not able to, yeah, wait, let's ask it. And maybe yeah. if you want to collect uh, the stats, we- That's okay free to ping in like the channel and I can have like a count of mm, all good all good I can just ask now so um imagine uh this questionnaire just now we saw five categories so for each sorry I just go back so imagine for each practice there's a set of questionnaires like low performing high performing um, and there's five sections for ways of working, for your continuous delivery, for your data practices, your ML engineering practice and deployment. So would something like uh, this be, you know, something that you would use in your team or share in your team? If that's a yes, could I get a thumbs up? If not, it's okay. Be brutally honest. So I just want to validate like if it's useful to invest effort. So if this book is something useful, is there a gesture for maybe as well? Maybe if someone... I do this if you're off camera. <laughs> cool. So that's about half. So thank you uh, for the feedback. Cool. Yeah. So to, uh, I think, close off, essentially about bringing people together as we start that off with the definition, like whether you're UX, your data scientist, your ops, your API developer, kind of all coming together to apply um, um, product thinking, lean delivery and engineering to deliver our, a great outcomes for our customers. And these are the kind of the set of practices that we've seen, like if you don't do this practice, probably, you know, you might pay some costs. If you're not writing tests, probably you'll be doing a lot of manual testing, um, you know, that, that kind of idea. So yeah, with that, uh, that's it. I will share a few links on Zoom. And we are also hiring. So if you're keen to join ThoughtWorks um, in the data space or you know, for any other role that you're playing, uh, feel free to email me and I can forward it on. Yeah. 
Oh, any questions or feedback or thoughts? Uh, David Tan, if there is like someone wants to uh, reach out to you after this, what would be the best way? Yeah, that's a great question. So I'll drop my email in the Zoom chat now. And yeah, feel free to ping me if you have, you know, want to discuss about this in our handbook. Um, I have a question, oh, I guess maybe a comment. Um, all these like points are really agreeable. So what do you think makes it so difficult for the industry to actually adopt these practices and get that like actually going and do it? Yeah. Mm, yeah. Um, my personal reflection, what I take away is um, that there's just two worlds colliding. So like, um, it just takes that intentional cultivation, I think, to, you know, cross-pollinate engineering practices like automated testing in CI uh, in, in the CI pipelines or even doing user testing. And another dimension, another factor could be like who's in the room type of thing. So if it's a room of hammers, then we say, okay, this is a nail, like, let's do it. But then if we have that cross-functional team shape, like with UX, with, um, you know, team, a diverse team, different gender, different role, background, and then we start to see uh, different problems. So I think like, I think at one point in our team, we were just data scientists and ML engineers. So it was very engineering focused. But I think what we learned at some months later, we could have learned if, you know, there was a UX shaped person asking us the right questions. So I think it's about, yeah, having the right uh, team shapes and also just maybe being courageous or bold in saying like this, Two, two worlds coming together, like there are things we can learn from both sides. Mm. I guess that's also slowly happening, I guess, um, with the software um, industry, they, they had so much time to actually develop it and, and get to a point where CICD is baked into what they do. Yeah, exactly. Mm. I think team, uh, team shapes also, I feel has a fact influence. So like I've seen two teams just so it's Conway's law essentially, which is Conway's law is saying your software will reflect or look like your organizational structure. So what we had was like two teams and the software mapped that. And somehow just being in two different teams, just as that friction to reach out and say, oh, how do you solve this problem? Uh, so in the end, like instead of reaching out, I just solved this problem myself. And what we found out was like, both teams solve the same problem. So the software reflects that there were two solutions and because of two teams. So something maybe about a comp, comp, uh, what they call maybe center of excellence model where there's a data practice within the organization where people talk and feel it's like we're part of the same team. It's okay to share and talk that that could help as well. Yeah, and I think adding to what David mentioned, based on my recent experience as well, the moment we say center of excellence, uh, organizations start thinking about centralizing the tool, which again would become a bottleneck if you try to centralize everything. So I think that also when we say platform or a centralization, it should not, no one should think that people are suggesting that, you know, bring a, you know, have a fancy workbench, a single tool where everyone can work in and which will create it's more about evangelizing having frameworks consistent framework and consistent template um yeah from my recent experience sorry i meant to put a like 100 emoji <laughs> do we have more questions cool uh yeah uh, thanks, thanks, David, for the talk. It was really, really helpful. So I'll quickly move on to the next section. But folks, feel free to reach out to Dave uh, or, you know, ping uh, any of us in the uh, meetup chat as well if you want to reach out to David Tan and have more questions. So now is the time for community marketplace, just in case if you are, you know, looking for a job or uh, you are a recruiter and uh, looking for um, um, employ employees to join your organization. So feel free to unmute yourself and pitch in, or if there's a conference that you want to share with everyone, feel free to uh, share that. Now is the time. Going once, going twice.
open tries. If not anyone, I have something to share. So uh, we have uh, ThoughtWorks has uh, or every year uh, would do XConf Australia, uh, which is somewhere in September. I don't, I'll share the link with you all. So if you, um, it has some cool topics, uh, maybe, uh, I, yeah, I'll share the link. So it's not just data, but one of the topic is data. And I think one of the topics is new SQL. And uh, there are other some cool uh, tech talk topics as well. So it's it's a free uh, conference uh, and it will not be an online, but in the real world. Uh, so if you're interested, uh, yeah. Uh, the other conference that is coming up soon is Data Engineering Bytes, uh, which is dedicated to data. So there's a Sydney version and a Melbourne version. And again, it's not an online conference. It's in the real world. But I think there are tickets. Uh, yeah, I'll, uh, you know, one of us will share the link in the Meetup channel. And if you're interested to join, you can join that. Um, yeah, there's another uh, conference as well. Sorry. Um, it's also, I think, in, it's there's one in Sydney and Melbourne. Um, it's the Deep Learning and Enterprise AI Summit um, by Rework. So um, I think that's also paid as well. Um, but I'll be one of the panelists, so like come on along if, if you have a chance as well. Oh, that's cool. Sam, would you be able to share the link in yeah, the yeah. Meetup as well? I mean, you can share the Meetup page so that it's available to everyone. Um, anyone else wants to share anything? Just uh, one announcement. So I've shared a link in the chat. So it's our ThoughtWorks Works data mini blogs. So every, um, I think one or every few weeks we publish um, our thinking on data engineering, ML and ops. So if you'd like to receive that, you can click the link and subscribe. Thanks, David. We have another audience in the meetup. Cool. Um, I said bye bye. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cool. Um, yeah, thank you everyone for joining in. And I mean, the reason we have put ThoughtWorks is like we thanks to ThoughtWorks along with the audience and speaker as well. That you know, there's a certain cost that we have to incur for running the meetup. So ThoughtWorks have been paying. And once we start the on real world, we'll have cost for pizza and beers as well. So advanced thanks to ThoughtWorks. But yeah, uh, uh, above that, you know, thank you all for attending because it's the community um, who, uh, you know, helps us in running this. And feel free to, if you have feedback, let us know if there are any topics that you would want to um uh, um, you know, want us to host uh, specific topics in future. Yeah, or if you want... Uh, uh, if you want to present and it's a safe place, uh, so feel free to, you know, uh, share what you would want to speak on. We can host you as well. Um, yeah. And thank you, everyone. And next would be on 25th of August. We'll share the details uh, near to that date, whether it will be offline and online. We are still evaluating, uh, but we'll surely share the details once we are almost uh, near to that date. Um, yeah, thanks everyone, Ryan. And uh, is there anything else you would want to pitch in, share? I'll just um, thank you again to David for that um, talk this evening. And thank you all for being here. And uh, yeah, certainly looking forward to hearing um, from all of you all. And uh, certainly sounds like there's a couple of exciting in-person real 3D space events coming up. So yeah, exciting times. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy your dinner. Thanks. Bye. Thanks so. Thank you. Bye.